you ready for the incredible sound of classic rock? No? Good, because now it's time for Visiting the Village. Hello and welcome to Visiting the Village. I'm Paul Kilduff Taylor, and joining me as ever is the infinite Ian Hardingham. Hello, Mr. Paul Kilduff Taylor. I am not included in Monopoly Star Wars this week, or any week. Let's get out of this dungeon. It's the top story. Mr. Biffo, aka Paul Rose, wrote this week about self referential media and how games can avoid some of the mistakes that have already been made in TV, movies, and music. He mentions at one point uh, the BBC's blanket ban on any pitches about making TV, which is interesting. Do we think Meta is here for good? Uh, yeah, this feels like uh, the Beginner's Guide and games like this and mm-hmm. the uh, RPG that you've been playing. Yeah, I think Meta's here for good. Um, I really enjoy Hollywood movies about Hollywood movies. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about it. Uh, A lot of in-jokes that I really appreciate tends to be uh, very, very sort of poking fun at themselves when you have a a movie about the movie business. And I tend to just like them, almost all of them. Uh, So am I going to like games that are about making games? Well, making games is not, not particularly glamorous. Uh, I've never been drawn to playing the the sort of the sim game developer games that they've never been attractive to me, but extremely meta games, breaking the fourth wall, etc. Uh, sure. Yeah. This article talks about WarioWare being one mm. of the first really meta games. And I think that's true. Although, you know, Nintendo played it fairly straight. Uh, what do you think? I think that games are really now experimenting with a huge variety of different possible content. So people have really taken it to heart that you can make a game about anything. And one of the things they want to make a game about is themselves. So if you're a person who's making games, you want to talk about yourself, you're going to talk about making games. I don't think that's going to particularly go anywhere as an idea. I just think it's going to be one of those things where it will just evolve over time. You know, some things have done it in a fairly unsophisticated way uh, that we've seen recently, and I think that will just become more sophisticated. It's not something that particularly bothers me, although I do find it amusing that it's sort of taken until now for this to really kick in. Yeah, I think a lot of the traditional meta humour in games has been extremely bad and extremely self-defeating. Stuff Mm. like having a bad ladder interface and then kind of taking the mickey out of having to scale bad ladders in games while you're doing it and lots of things like that Uh, a lot of games think that it's funny to poke fun at bad things about games while really just being that bad which i think is kind of like making a a, an unfunny joke about jokes that aren't funny which is not in itself funny um so that so so it would be good to get rid of that uh also taking sort of making fun of games having bad voice acting with bad voice acting is just bad as well um you actually have to be really good i think to successfully uh you know make fun of that kind of thing so yeah if we're going to get some more advanced stuff now that's really good um again you know i I don't really enjoy stuff that just makes a bit of light-hearted jokes about traditional weaknesses of a medium that in itself is not something i find particularly exciting and that's what quite a lot of this article is talking about um that's just me it's got quite british humor sometimes to uh to poke fun at at oneself like that but i mean sure it's here to stay i mean just like everything else if it's done well that's cool yeah i think that there's sort of degrees with this so the the thing that you talked about a lot there your tv tropes term would be lampshading so it's where you 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 sort of you put a lampshade on something bad effectively so you laugh at the bad joke you mock the terrible accent and that is pretty much unless it's unexpected always terrible so in the context of something that's generally humorous it's sort of kind of expected that you might make that kind of joke and it's a bit tired and and so on um 
or in the case of where it's sort of it's the first go-to point for a joke, it can be weak as well. So I agree, like, games need to do that a bit less. Um, there are instances, sort of older instances, things like Earthbound. Uh, it's come up in a lot uh, discussion of Undertale as being sort of similar, and so Undertale's self-referential nature is actually more directly referential towards Earthbound than it is towards anything else. I'm not sure how much I buy that. I mean, yeah, a lot of this is really comes down to the fact that if you're going to try and be funny, then, you know, actually be funny. There aren't any really any rules about that much as we dislike this particular style of humour. Um, in terms of anything else, yeah, I, I, I think it's just a question of it being incorporated as part of the medium and moving on over time. I mean, some of the ways that, that Undertale does it are very funny. It, it establishes a lot of patterns and then it breaks the patterns sort of later on, and, that, and that's a good way of doing humour. But um, I also, I agree with the general tone of this I, I it's basically saying you know get get over yourself game developers and, and and i think that's something that needs to be said more i think one of the ways in which warioware is really effective is that it's actually casting a highlight on games mechanics rather than sort of uh, very abstract parts of games like ladders or bad inventory systems or bad voice acting warioware is really kind of quite effectively looking at how ridiculous the actual things that you do are, how simple mechanics are, and in attempting to pare down game design as far as you possibly can, uh, doing a great job of making you think about game design more. So WarioWare really is on the on the good side of that. Mm. I don't even remember a sort of gaming in-joke of this kind that I've really appreciated. I think there probably have been a couple. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do it better, and and it's still going to be cringeworthy when the first game you want to make is is sort of has so much of this narrative, this meta narrative about games in it. Like I think people need to understand that that's quite sophomoric and not do it. Yep. Um, also, I think. Uh, there are times, though, when this can really work. I mean, I think the best instance of it was probably in Space Quest, where you go through the portal to the sequel, and then you're in the sequel to Space Quest, and everything in that environment is some in-joke. So for me, that that was, at the time as well, being a bit younger, seeing someone do that in a game and really putting a lot of effort into that joke. Like They crafted this whole environment. They had all the different names of all the other Space Quest games that had led up, because it was like Space Quest 50 or something, that had led up to that. It's about, if you're going for a joke, then really go for it. Really, really, really sell it. Um, and I think that it's the laziness of self-referential stuff that is the problem, not the fact that people are doing it at all, I think. Yeah, be good, be surprising, be new, don't be bad. Don't be bad. James Grant has written about his experiences playing EVE Online for Eurogamer, specifically his role as a fixer for one of the most famous EVE players of all time, the Mitanni. Uh, Ian Honningham, do you want to be the guy or the guy that the guy counts on? I think I want to be the guy... Uh, yeah, we haven't talked about Eve enough. This article really reminded me how crazy Eve is. Mm. And uh, it made me even more sort of interested in Eve. Because what he's really talking about here is that there was this patch or this add-on released uh, seven or eight years ago that had a lot of extremely weird, hard-to-work-out, impenetrable mechanics and the idea of the article is that he's one of only a few people who really understood yeah. what you know the law of the land in Eve to the extent that, they, that, that coalitions who wanted to take over a system or do something a bit strange had to go to him like an obscure kind of lawyer so he could tell them how to do things, which sounds great. Uh, and and he's, he's writing this because apparently they're, they're going to patch out some of this stuff and they're, they're changing things around. Things are going to be a little bit less ludicrous which sounds really sad because eve's kind of there to be ludicrous mm. um but you know it, it just reminds me because i kind of feel like eve is completely amazing it's kind of a, a a representation of a thing that i dreamt about a lot uh fantasized about a lot existing before it came out um and it and, and the fancy i had was a space game with all these all these corporations and all this cooperation between players i mean it really actually feels extremely close to what I was thinking, what I feel the most surprising thing about Eve is that it hasn't really created a genre. It's yeah. just Eve. Mm. And people are either playing Eve or they're not playing Eve. There aren't a load of Eve likes, which I would have predicted a long mm. time ago. It's just Eve. Yep. It's almost like a social network. It's one of the things that if you want to play this kind of game, you are on Eve. 
And it, it's going to take a huge amount to make all of those people leave, Eve, because it has the very, very highly evolved system and very, very large player base that you need to facilitate this kind of thing. This exploit stuff really reminded me of um, Julian Dibble's book, Play Money, which is all about gold farming. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and in that book, he talks a lot about how players would sort of wait for patches and then they'd find the one thing that, that, that they could exploit from that patch and they'd all go and do it and they'd share all this information between them. So the actual excitement in the game was about sort of trading ways in which to exploit the game and the way that you kind of um, controlled and exploited that information socially. Um, and that's what Eve does. It really creates all these little wrinkles. I love his description of the war that started because a box was left unticked on an options page uh, leading to to the system's control to lap. Stuff like that uh, is all about what happens when you have a very large number of intelligent people attacking this big system. Yeah, I, I, I still kind of feel like whenever you read about these, these crazy events that happen in EVE, whenever you think about how awesome it is that you've got this massive, massive star system uh, with corporations of real human players fighting over control, it, it sort of seems like I want to have a better way of consuming it. We talk about eSports all the time. I yeah. feel like I want to watch Eve, but that mm. isn't really a thing that exists. And, no. and you know, I, I wonder if there's a missed opportunity there or, you know, and you tried to get into Eve, I remember, a very long time ago. And, it, and it's I very did. grindy to start with. You've got to work hard, which is fine. I mean, I always, mm. I think I said this in the podcast before, I was always expecting that the way to make this stuff meaningful was to put real money into it. But what they've really done is that you have to put real work into it. I know there's yep. money as well, but that's kind yeah. of how they get people super invested. I uh, mean, yeah, I, I, I played for a few evenings, probably like five or six evenings and it got through a good portion of the, the tutorial and so on i think my problem with it was really just how amazing the ui is i mean it, it's a well-known thing and also obviously it goes hand in hand with complexity but it really is like using it's sort of at a level of adobe premiere kind of terribleness the ui it's lots of tiny buttons it's so exhausting to use but the stuff that you can do in the game is great, like the freedom that you have. I mean, I think now, if I was trying to get into something like this, I would play Elite Dangerous, because that is a much more user-friendly UI, and it does also have the big player base, and I think they're kind of moving a little bit towards more direct player interaction in the world, so maybe that's the light version of EVE that people have wanted. Maybe. I, I mean, the stuff that really turns me on about EVE is the, is the ludicrous political stuff, mm. the kind of the, a lot of the stuff that's being talked about in this article about uh, how sovereignty of systems is decided, how people keep control of systems, and, and yeah, again, like politics, that's the kind of stuff that really excites me. But then th there's a, there must be a reason that I'm not doing it. Uh, I, 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 I've always wondered if there are, there's a possibility for a game that a lot of people... that becomes important because a lot of people do it in a very casual way, and then it sort of creates this importance for some people to do in a really extreme way and we're still we're still missing it even though eve mm. like feels close it also somehow feels really far away well something that i i need to play is uh is subterfuge which is ron carmel's new game um and that's about very kind of condensed short loops of alliances and bluffing and um kind of collaborative logistics so that i think is a bit of an attempt to try and get um that kind of gameplay into a more casual format that's sort of a little bit more accessible. But again, there are difficulties with that, you know, to, to run a good game of that, I think you probably need something like seven or eight very committed players, um, and that's difficult. And also not everyone likes that kind of game. Uh, it's definitely ruined a few friendships. Uh, you can see that on Twitter. People get into big arguments over over their subterfuge games. So I definitely think that they're... I'm not sure if Eve was a direct influence on that, but I, maybe people are starting to experiment with that, that political, that sort of alliance management side of things a bit more I, I guess so I mean the, the thing I'm just looking at this subterfuge game now and it looks a bit like a board game and that again is kind of the opposite of the stuff that I find exciting I like it when these things emerge you know initially Eve was a game about mining and getting better starships right and the, the politics and stuff is the kind of the yeah I guess the meta game and that again is what really excites me like uh, people have tried to do it I remember there was a Korean MMO where someone was a supreme ruler that got elected, mm. yes. um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, obviously you can have a board game or whatever that, that, that tries to distill those mechanics, 
Um, but there's something so nice when they actually really emerge from something else that is a meaningful thing someone's doing. Well, I think Subterfuge is really based around that idea. So it's it's based around, you know, you can play it without any of that happening, uh, I believe. So it's sort of, it has a fairly heavy logistical basis. I think the players are doing resource management and stuff on their own and you have limited resources, so you're kind of pushed outside your own territory. So I, it's not like one of those board games, I think, where, you know, it's like, who is the Cylon or whatever? I don't think it's it's kind of that structure. Um, I think that it's aiming to be something where that does, that is a bit more emergent. Fair enough. Right. Jean Romero has published a new level for the original Doom. Apparently it has been 21 years since he last made one. Game Informer had a good look at that with a a kind of video review that's worth checking out. Are there any other classic games you'd like to see revisited by their creators? (laughs) Or indeed by John Romero. (laughs) I'd like to see John Romero make levels for all of my favourite games. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it speaks to how good one level can be. Um, Mm. You know, one level in Spelunky, if someone created a, a little random generator of one level, that'd be pretty awesome one thief level i mean that's happened yep. sometimes and that just feels like so much about thief is being part of the bigger narrative and that experience you have playing single player so it can be a bit underwhelming i do i actually would like to play this level i want to know what john romero has to say about doom <laughs> all this time later apart from pay me more attention please um what about you i think that it would be interesting to see some more deus ex stuff for the first Deus Ex from the original team with that that editor. Because I think we had that question last week about, you know, should should teams be taking on these old engines and so on? I, I would really like to see just like an add-on pack for Deus Ex 1, not a mod, but, but made by some of the original team. Because levels in that game, I mean, that was my thief, really. I, I found the levels there so evocative compared to the levels in other games. So that would be the one I'd, I'd like to see. And yeah, this is a weird phenomenon. I guess... We're seeing now these classic games where their creators are still alive. You know, I think it would be awesome if John Romero released an expansion for Doom. I would definitely play that if he made a sort of 20 level pack now and put it on Steam. I'm sure he'd make quite a lot of money and it would be good. Maybe he will. Yeah, 20 level pack. I I would actually be interested. Like an Mm. album from John Romero. And that actually is the key for where I think this gets interesting. When it's one person who can do it, that's cool. Um, the extent to which one person can make a meaningful Deus Ex level is you know, it's quite hard for them, although one person mm. could probably do one. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, one person can make a lot of Doom levels. I Because, th- I, you know, really it's... You know, you get a big new game and it's a massive team effort and 20 or 50 or 100 people have made it and it's really cool and that's good. But then in terms of extending it, um, you, you I think you feel like I want to drill down to one individual person, like... Um, you know, if uh, if Thingy Smith, Harvey Smith, and Warren Spector were both tasked with creating one level based on a theme <laughs> for Deus Ex, and you see what they both do with it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure ammo would be an important, uh, ironic point in Harvey Smith's version. Um, so yeah, that that would be interesting. It's always nice when one person can do something meaningful, and that one person himself is meaningful. Yeah, I guess the restrictions of Doom really make that possible. So games that have some good constraints around their levels. I mean, I would be interested to see more nuclear throne levels and stuff like that, just because I feel that's an interesting format and there's a lot that could be played with there. I think this is sort of leading me onto another thought, just in terms of like, if you like a game, there's always types of content for it that are going to be interesting for, for certain styles of game. Um, and I still think devs, certainly indie devs, definitely underexploit that. You know, the, the people if people like something, they generally want more of it. I'm surprised that John Romero hasn't done the John Romero signature collection previously, to be honest. Yeah, there, there seems like there should be a middle ground between official DLC and, mm. uh, and user-generated content. Because I never really want to go and dip my toes in the depths of UGC, particularly. No. Even for something like uh, Mario Maker, where it's completely designed around that, or Little Big Planet, uh, there's just something about me that kind of, <clears throat> I'm not interested in in trying to find which ones are good, and then you know I prefer to be a bit of a narrative behind the extra content. So I, I feel like it would be amazing if if creators of yeah maybe indie games just managed to get one other person, one interesting person to do something like whatever's most appropriate. Maybe you get someone to make a little bit of a texture set. Mm, uh, yeah. it, it does happen a little bit. Um, I think it would be kind of interesting to examine 
different games and see what like a meaningful thing you could do in each one is. I've mm. always been really excited by the idea of um, recording new barks for all of the energy enemies in a in a game. You know, that's yeah. something that one person could do. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny. I, I obviously modders have done absolutely everything possible, but it, may, it takes on a different a different feeling when it's someone who has some import themselves. But mm. of course, a, a lot of people don't have enough time. Right, yeah, and it is, it, the question is kind of what is a unit of this thing? I mean, barks are, are a good example, announcer voices in Dota, things like that, are a good unit that someone can do meaningfully well. I'm, I'm the same as you with UGC. I generally don't like the stuff that professional devs do enough to want to see things by amateur devs, generally. I, I'm, I'm sort of a bit cynical and jaded. <clears throat> And I like to get the absolute best possible content I can. So that's always put me off from that. But again, it's about what system you create and what the limitations of it are, I think. Yeah, totally. I, I think it's really nice that people get to share levels. And I'm sure there are people out there who enjoy playing other randoms levels. But yeah, mm. I, I feel the same. I want to I want to have some... Um, the people who are making the stuff I'm playing, I want them to have some standing. I feel like Mario Maker's actually got the closest to making this okay. I think a lot of people have made good Mario Maker levels that sort of show off their own personality. Um, you know, I've seen things like with, with journalists, there's been one guy who's been making stupidly hard Mario Maker levels and sending them around everyone to annoy them. And I really like that. That's a good way of expressing yourself. If you can make something that's fun to your friends with UGC, then I think that's the right area for it. Yeah, I still I'm still waiting for a game that manages to gamify the playing of other people's levels in the right way, like meta yeah. gamify it. Give me a reason for playing a subset. You know, the fact that there are five million levels makes me less likely to want to play one. But if mm. there's an interesting kind of <laughs> overworld that somehow organizes my play of these things, and and you know, I, I've always liked the idea of those games where you kind of uh, design your own defensive structures around your own base. Mm. I think Ubisoft had like a, a free to play game that they were trying on that one. Uh, I think it had some name like uh, Amazing Loot or something. Mm. Um, and that's interesting. And of course, Metal Gear Solid's been very popular doing something a bit like that recently, although not not with a huge amount of user control. So I feel like that, like a bit like E, that's another idea which I'm slightly surprised hasn't taken off more. Mm. Indeed. PC Games N have an interesting piece about the making of DMA Design's classic puzzle game, Lemmings. Is there anything we can learn now from this style of design? Yeah, sure. I mean, Lemmings is great. A again, like nowadays, Lemmings has been so consumed by the by the forward progress. Very popular game. Lots of people have taken parts of it, and now everything's uh, uh, iOS puzzle game. But I remember playing Lemmings, and it felt like a big PC experience at the time. It felt big and expansive and exciting like you didn't know what was going to happen uh, and uh, you know part of that reason obviously is that it was back in the new days of games but and it was a new game but you know don't you want to play a game even if it's kind of in a relatively narrow genre like puzzle genre don't you want to play a game that feels like the next level could present anything at you and it, I think the presentation of this kind of thing is really important as well when you have something with very polished presentation everything's got like a nice artist generated glow on it or or reflection thing on it uh it always makes me feel like it's it's less possible that something completely ridiculous is going to happen in mm -hmm. the next level and the more pixelated and functional the graphics the more i feel like they may, might do something really stupid uh next level lemmings was so evocative because it had so many different things happening at once it had these really detailed animated characters who who were tiny and that was very evocative you know they were very emotive characters then it had the interesting weird tile sets that just seemed very arcane and didn't really look like they were from any other game and also it had the ability to destroy the terrain at the pixel level so you could do all this stuff to manipulate these weird worlds with these characters and then finally you had this ui which was i think um his article mentions that the levels were made in or related to somehow Dulux Paint. And it really looked like a kind of paint interface where you had all these different tools and then you could use them. So it was really about this very high level relationship between uh, you and, and this world populated by these characters. And I really don't think anything else has come close to that since. Yeah, you're right. The, uh, the pixel level gameplay. Mm. Uh, that this had and Worms 1 had as well. Obviously, all the other Worms yep. had it as well. But 
you know, that was the first. Uh, it was just incredibly exciting. And yeah, mm. it was a bit like pain. I'm trying to remember, actually. I, I'm not... I, I seem to recall that you put a power on a lemming, uh, you know, not necessarily by directly clicking on it, um, but maybe that's... Compl- I'm just remembering something like you, you put it at the place where you wanted the lemming to turn into the thing rather than necessarily directly on the lemming, but I could be remembering something wrong there. Um, in the in the first version, you definitely had to click. Right, okay. Either on the button or on the lemming. Uh, yeah, there's, some, there's something going on. And, and, and the puzzles were so great. Like... It's so. I think games are amazing when you have extremely well designed puzzles, but in a really freeform space. Mm. Uh, and that reminds me of all of, all of the all of these great games that feel like they're they're big games where you can do anything, but they also have really good design because the puzzles are really well designed. So, I mean, what a game! I, I suppose yeah. I'm not the only person who just it always just gets so excited by the first of these games and kind of gets turned off by the the sequels and i feel the same way about worms um mm. as worms got more polished and more cartoony it really turned me off um it always feels like the thing that people do after they've made one of these really amazing uh interactive experiences is, is start doing sort of graphical and visual and presentation wise stuff that again kind of limits the the possibilities for me as a consumer yeah, and there's, there's an interesting process there. I mean, you're right, Worms is the perfect thing to bring up because it, it's, again, doing this pixel-wise thing and it had the characters that were that were really funny. You know, Worms sort of made the violence okay by the fact that they, they were ludicrous, like little pink squiggles with hats on. Um, and that was always, you know, hilarious sort of, as a young teenager, that was really funny. Um, but you're right, once something becomes successful, I think people feel the need to sort of IPify it. So the worms have to become, you know, proper characters with faces. Similarly, the lemmings have to, to kind of go that way and, and become more fully modelled. And I do think that takes something away because imaginatively looking at a collection of pixels, your brain is doing the work of attributing agency to that. Whereas if it has a face and it's animating and it's talking in a sort of weird American accent in a cartoon, then suddenly it becomes this very strong idea, some version that someone else has made of that. But by the same token, commercially... <sighs> It's so difficult to expand on something that is just a blob or a dot or whatever um, without giving it some personality. You can't really, I mean, well, you couldn't in the 90s put that on a T-shirt. Now sort of retro graphic stuff is is more popular, so you might be able to go further with it. But, yeah, if you want your Worms franchise and your Worms Saturday morning cartoon, then you, you, can't, uh, you can't just have blobs. Yeah, sure. I, it's sort of why... I've always thought that the first expansion pack for original games has sometimes been like the greatest event. Yeah. Because not only is that obviously just like the original game, no one's changing any graphics for that, but it's also the designers being just given another chance to really screw around with mm. a tool set they've created, do some really subversive stuff, spend a bit of time fixing some stuff they didn't have to before. Sometimes you can get some really good juice out of the orange by spending another couple of <laughs> couple of months. So uh, yeah, the first expansion pack for Worms one was great. The first expansion pack for Lemons was Lemons was pretty good as well. Um, so that's like before that the, the sequelitis starts to start to come in. I, I'm not really suggesting that, that people shouldn't do that. I, I think you're right that if you want to cross over and have big success, having like these big accessible um uh, graphics or whatever or personalization is is what is what you need to do but it's just uh it makes yeah. me personally sad i feel like a lot of the time that the commercial and creative sides of these things can work in harmony and i think this might be a time when they can't i don't think you can keep something that interesting and have this characterization the one thing that you hear from people who work in licensing or who work in kind of promoting any kind of brand is that you need characters um i just wonder maybe there is a less crass less obvious way of doing it than the way that a lot of people do do it but it just seems like a something you can't resolve sadly yeah answers on a postcard if anyone else knows the answer to that retro site the dreamcast junkyard have an article up about the arcade precursor to the dreamcast known as naomi Apparently, the system's name was a pun. The origin of the name Naomi came from the idea that the system was intended to be a continuation of the Model 3 arcade board, and so has the meaning of final model or super model. It was said for that reason they named the system after the famous fashion model of that time, Naomi Campbell. Is this the greatest lost console? Uh, hold on. Uh, the Dreamcast? The Naomi. Oh, the Naomi. Uh, is the Naomi a... I thought it was a... Uh, I... I... Okay, sorry. I, th- I actually thought Naomi came out as a, as a, as an arcade board. 
Um, so, yeah, so producer Jimmy also got annoyed with me for this question. I'm, I'm eliding the concept of arcade boards with lost consoles. Is that not an okay thing to do? Uh, okay, well, I maybe not. Um, well, well, we'll see. We can have answers on a post for that one as well. But it's it's a good time to talk about the Dreamcast. I like uh, the, the, the writer of this article spends an awful lot of time talking about how the Dreamcast had a VGA port. And how it was like basically it and some versions of the Xbox 360 are the only consoles ever to have a VGA output, and that's because um, it's of its arcade roots. And uh, the, the Dreamcast, I, I, yeah, the Dreamcast was always going to have was based off that technology, that hardware, and whether or not that made it a better or worse home console, I think is a little unclear. Mm. Uh, I think it probably was a negative uh, in the end. Yes. Um, R.I.P. the arcades, man. <laughs> yeah, there isn't this thing of there isn't this sort of abstract thing that people are aiming for now. I mean, I guess you look at CG in movies and go, maybe games could look like that. But actually, there isn't that much of a gulf between uh, what games look like and what CG in movies is like now. I think I don't know if that's just completely perceptual. I'm sure. Like visual artists would complain at me for saying that, but it, it doesn't seem like it used to be where you'd see something in a film and go, wow, maybe one day I could move around in that environment. You don't have that anymore. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a, a thing I feel very often. I remember the uh, the 3D rendered intro sequence of Magic Carpet, which is about the most ugly 3D Studio 3 like rendering possible, and just the idea at the time that a game would ever look like that yeah. was amazing, and games looked like that in about two years later. Uh, I mean, you know, in terms of how good CG is, I mean, the best CG uh, is the CG you don't notice probably nowadays. Yeah. Um, whole streets that are actually pretty much CG'd and, you, and, you, and because they spent a lot of time on it and because they're making sure you only look at it in a certain way that you kind of don't realise. But you're yeah. right. It, what are games aiming for? I mean, there's a new graphics card technology coming out. I'm told by producer Jimmy uh this summer and that's going to make a big difference and, and apparently vr is like pushing a new wave of uh, of new hardware because mm. running stuff at high res at 120 hertz is still hot um yes for the yeah. current hardware so this is the first time in a while where there's been a real need to actually push forward the pc stuff but that's just to maintain the current graphics level on a more demanding output um and i know that i'm Maybe it's my age or whatever, but I'm not interested in super graphics anymore. Um, mm. And sometimes I think the more stylized stuff is more interesting. And, and for me, it's about more fidelity in what you're completely simulating. So I guess like stuff like survival sims, I guess yeah. stuff like Minecraft, being able to do things like that with more and more fidelity at the kind of at the pixel level, pixels being important. I seem to remember a few years ago, I mean, like maybe eight years ago, I, I tried to prototype something where each pixel was was a it was a game object in its own right and that was pretty hard especially because yeah. i only gave myself four hours to do it um <laughs> but i guess that's that's maybe what they're aiming for it feels so crazy to me to be sitting here saying this now if i go back to to eight-year-old paul and say you know when you're 32 you're going to be having a serious discussion where you say i think we're so close to realism now that that's become boring and it, it it's like if you look at the way more realistic games are presented they still look plasticky and they still look fake and it will be different when when you have photorealism don't get me wrong but I, but i feel like that's kind of that's just not interesting like you i, I it's it, it's not going to add very much if this thing has more reflections or more whatever now um you do see the odd breakout thing, like everybody's gone to the rapture, I think is kind of a really interesting use of realism because it's modeling a different type of environment that would only be good to model with the current sort of graphics tech. So when you see stuff like that, it does it does have an effect on you. But also like you, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in stylized stuff. I'm really interested in the things that can be done with computer graphics as a form in, in its own right now. Um, I think that's true of a lot of people. I think this last mile when it comes to photorealism is going to be, I mean, years and years. When I think yeah. of uh, us looking at that NBA Jam game where every so yeah. often it would look like real and then it would suddenly look like uh, your your entire vision had warped and you were in a nightmare <laughs> and everything yeah. had gone completely weird. I, I, and I actually, you know, 
I don't know how long it is until we actually have completely believable environments where I don't know if I'm in the game or yeah. not. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not like massively convinced that's ever going to happen before something else happens. Mm. Um, you know, something in your brain possibly. Uh, and I, and I, yeah, I, I think you put it perfectly when you say it's just not interesting anymore. Yeah. Um, the graphics are now definitely functional enough to, to, to when we're playing in a battlefield. Um, or whatever, it's it's no longer the graphics that are ever holding back what's mm. going on, and we're much more focused. You know, I think about Fallout Four. Fallout Four's got some fairly weird graphics, but they're yeah. they're pretty good graphics. And and everything that I is wrong with Fallout Four is nothing to do with the graphics. Mm. Um, and that's also why you know we don't know how long it will be till the next console generation because uh, I just don't know what the next games that are, are really going to push the consoles necessarily are. Yeah. I mean, and also this is a kind of a weird point now. But if there is another photorealism arms race, are people going to go back down to 30 hertz? Because a lot of games are now going up to 60 hertz right? Um, with the new consoles because that, that's kind of what they want to do next. But maybe some games come out and they've got like some kind of next level graphics. And in order to compete, they have to go back down in frame rate, which, uh, which would oh, be sure. suboptimal. Yeah, people always are always making that trade-off. I mean, one of the interesting things with... Um with COD blobs was, was that it was had a really high frame rate and, and a lot of console games I've played don't. And it was it was really interesting seeing what that added to the experience. I mean it, it was really nice. And obviously that game looks good. I wouldn't say it's the best looking game ever, but it's but it's a good looking game. So yeah, th- th- those are all trade-offs that people definitely are willing to make and willing to change around, as you say, for different priorities. Um just going back to this topic quickly, that the, the that, that arcade divide, if you read any 90s games magazine, you had this phrase, arcade quality graphics, yeah. which got kind of beyond parody. And it's just so weird to, like I said initially, not have that other benchmark out there, not have this thing that you can go and look at on a screen that is better on the screen than, than the thing you have at home. It's just weird. Yeah, I mean, th- what few arcade games still exist, I-, I don't think they ever look as good as high-end PC games or console games. I don't think that's what arcade games are really going for anymore yeah like yeah games analytics wonks quantic foundry have created a somewhat controversial graph this has been on twitter today they plot various games along the axes of excitement and strategy and note that there are no games that they have determined to be both exciting and strategic ian harding are you exciting or strategic uh, uh, r- mm, I'm neither <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, it definitely goes uh, back and forth depending on the time of day. Uh, this is cool. This is a great way to criticize a game. I love um, this. City Skylines, Football Manager, and Transport Tycoon are all all low strategy and low excitement. <laughs> um, XCOM is like a, a bit in the middle, and mm. then the only games that are kind of really decided are. Well, apparently above the cognitive threshold, maybe you're going to tell me what that means, uh, are Dota and StarCraft, which is great. Counter-Strike, just below the cognitive threshold. I love that League of Legends is below and Dota is above. I don't know what that means. I don't want to know. It's just like the chasm. League of, of Legends on this graph, for, for the people not, not looking at the same screen as we are, League of Legends is decided to be very slightly more exciting than Dawn of the Ancients, but much less strategic. Mm. Yes, yes, I know. And he- Heroes of the Storm is less exciting and strategic than either of them, which is just true. Like that's just correct. The maths is is there. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't know what to say about this. It's so weird. It's such a weird thing, and people are forever trying to interpret the differences between these types of games. But they're so radically different. Like to even put Dota and City Skylines in the same place. Yeah, I can't wait for the millions of, like, mild parody versions of this which plot, like, fun against LOL for, Mm. like, every single game. I can't wait. That's, like, going to be funny for at least the next 12 hours. Um, I met someone at uh, MGF, the great uh, business mobile forum uh, that I was at the other day, and he has a company based in uh, wonderful Leamington Spa, and they made a free-to-play game, and he said the way they did their market research was he got a market research company to find female gamers uh, between a certain age who played both League of Legends and Candy Crush, 
um, because he thought that there was a group of gamers who were kind of playing things in, you know, in between this very casual thing and this very hardcore thing. And he said they really struggled to find them. But when he did find them, they were sort of fantastically useful people to talk to about making his game. So he designed his game kind of for those people and it went on and w was a good free to play success. So I think, although I'm kind of mocking this, actually, if you're looking at ways of grouping together and thinking about different games in relation to each other, that can actually be really useful. Maybe there are people who do play StarCraft and Transport Tycoon, and that tells you something about that super, super micro niche of people that's really good to aim for. Maybe there is some point to this. Okay, right, I'm just trying to get my head around this guy finding a load of women mm. who play both LOL yep. and Candy Crush. That's pretty yep. amazing. I know, I know. Um, he, he said that he said that his dev team and this market research company thought he was mental. Uh, and then he he did it, and they managed to find some, and, and they turned out to be really useful. So there uh, you go. I just think he's single. I, that's really <laughs> interesting. Okay, well, uh, okay. Well, I don't know what else to say about that, but there are going to be a lot more of these graphs. And <laughs> yeah, I'm more excited graphs for that. on the horizon. <laughs> According to an anonymous insider, a deliberate decision was made to make less merchandise featuring the female lead character of the new Star Wars movie, Rey. Apparently Lucasfilm believed that sales would be harmed if, product featured, if products featured a woman instead of a man. Now, we've seen a lot of stuff like this. Uh, and the question I really want to ask is, do you think there's any basis to this? Because a lot of a lot of industries have now moved on. The movie industry's moved on. TV has moved on. Comics, games are moving on with this perception about female lead characters. But why are toys not moving on uh this is a bit weird i i'm really kind of slightly boggled but i was actually having a conversation at the pub with someone yesterday who told me that he thought that while disney were you know somewhat moving with the times that he actually thought they were behind on feminist issues and i don't think he was talking about this so i guess it's mm. possible i mean i have to say that i think that the idea that uh disney told Hasbro to not have the the lead character in the Star Wars film as one of the Monopoly pieces is pretty bizarre. Yeah. I mean, like, I just want to be clear that she is the lead character in this film, so they can't dislike mm. girls that much. Right. So I guess the, the idea here is that um, women who are the lead character in films sell those films, but, but, but action figure people don't like to have women. Mm. Um there was one interesting part of this that they were talking about uh not not ray but um uh black widow from yes. the avengers movies and there was a bit, a bit of a, a question apparently you know a lot of these these women are i'm afraid still sexualized in these films hmm. and i was slightly wondering not only is that a problem for buying toys for kids and and sort of in inverted commas family values but i i, I do slightly wonder if I mean, I'm not a guy who collects miniatures, but if I was, I think I might feel worse about having like some weirdly like sexualized three inch tall thing of, of, of what's her name rather than like, you know, blade or someone. Yeah. Like, is, is there some aspect to which it's kind of eating itself with this sexualization? But I, again, I still find it weird that Disney would have told a bunch of games companies this. Right. And, and, and there's a, a post by the comics beat where they sort of, really cool bullshit on some of the things um <clears throat> including that given the sort of general as you say portrayal of of these female characters anyway the fact that that one specifically would be over sexualized for some reason is 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 a bit off and i agree with that i think that is a bit off i don't know i mean the extent to which it sort of would make someone who collects miniatures uncomfortable i mean i think that the market is, is like the action figure market is the real market here so it's going to be kids um i do wonder if there is a general skew towards um, young boys having action figures and girls not, be that cultural or social or whatever, um, and that, that young boys prefer to have male action figures in general. Um, that doesn't seem... Whether that state is a good state or not is questionable. That doesn't seem that potentially unlikely to me. Although, thinking about it, you know, I liked action figures when I was a kid, and if I had seen this Star Wars movie... I would have been completely happy to have an action figure of that character because she's a very cool character. And they did a good job with her characterization. So, I don't Yeah, know. I just think it's weird. I mean, again, sh she's the main character. If if she wasn't, mm. this would kind of all make a lot more sense. I'm just going to read you a quote mm. from someone who uh, who says he had this insider knowledge. Uh, and, and we're going to have Star Wars spoilers from now on. 
Okay. So if you haven't seen Star Wars or you don't want to hear us talk about how much we don't like it, <laughs> stop listening now. Different um, version of spoilers, From this yes. guy who thinks he's got inside of dirt, they put a huge investment into marketing and merchandising the Kylo Ren character. They presumed he would be the breakout role from the film. They were completely surprised when it was Rey everyone identified with and wanted to see more of. Hold mm. on. Kylo Ren's the bad guy. Mm. They were surprised when everyone identified with the, with the main female character and not with, you know, Nuvo Darth, Raider, Darth, Darth Vader. Am I wrong about this? Have I got the characters mixed up? Is, is that really that surprising, though? Because often the, the merchandise character is not the lead character in the film. Uh, yeah, all right, I, I guess that's true. I'm kind of... It, it, I, I'm. It's making me review how the filmmakers felt about Kylo Ren's character. This quote, um, because mm. you know, like, I, he, you know, again, he feels a lot like uh, Hayden Christensen from yeah. Yeah. The prequels to me, which, yep. which didn't go especially well. No, and I, I like Adam Driver uh, yep. performance in this quite a lot. And I like Adam Driver in general, but I'm still a little surprised that maybe it's I'm coming from the other direction. Mm. Why did they make Ray's character if they were not expecting people to think she was like a you know great or a badass or whatever yeah um i i I just don't kind of get it i i don't get it and and i'm i really wish that this wasn't presented in this kind of making a murderer style dubious (laughs) format you know i wish they hadn't tainted the the barbie on the in the evidence rack because I want some data on this. Like, I, th- this also claims that you know the princess, the Disney princess merchandise is doing worse now. Oh my the- god, this quote is amazing. Princess yeah. toy sales are in free fall. Free fall, and Disney yeah, and- can't give away princess toys anymore. Oh my goodness, this st- this is just coming out. This is amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, to go back to the original point, to try and get back to some sense here. Yeah, mm. I-, I think it's completely believable that you could put a female. Uh, uh, action figure and a male action figure next to each other in a shop and you could see that loads and loads more of the male are bought mm. and whether or not that means it's okay for them to do that in general or you know is a completely yeah. different discussion yes. i mean as far as monopoly is concerned <laughs> I, I have like absolutely no time for them leaving her out of monopoly completely i mean you've right. got four yeah. characters out and one of the one of the four is like the weird ass um emperor giant guy Right. Who okay. is not in the film very much. Yes. And like definitely should be, you know, I'm just kind of, the thing is, I'm, I'm basically inclined to believe all this. And I'm just a bit mm. surprised by it. Like, what what year is this? I know. Yeah. The, this, uh, the Monopoly thing is really weird. Like, you should have the main character from the film in the Monopoly thing. And, and someone said on Twitter, you know, it's not like the hat is the major narrative crux of Monopoly. <laughs> you know, just Yeah, we haven't Monopoly. even touched on this whole idea that, that the defense is that, um, something about Ray's plot is given away by having her in a in a game um, I suppose that you're supposed to not know that she sides with the rebels but she's again I mean I just it's all very boggling to me I, I don't really understand any of this but I want to see data you know I, I've seen a, a lot of people say things like this but this Christmas my my niece's presents were a toy drill and a <laughs> Disney princess dress and she really liked both of them. Uh, but when she got the Disney princess dress, she said, um, Mummy, what do I do with this? <laughs> Which I thought was really good. I thought all the feminists would like that. She wanted it to be for doing something. And we said, it's cool. You you can wear it to the party you're going to. She went, wow. And then she realized that's what you do with it. So she liked that idea. So it's like, I don't really think that uh, anecdotally, uh, little girls are going to stop liking princess things. But they're just now they're just going to be given and like... A, a greater range of toys, which is of course great, but I don't think they're going to stop liking those things. Oh, that's interesting. You've just kind of given me a different, like, weird theory on this now, okay. because everyone apparently agrees that Barbie's sort of bad, you know, not good, right? That, that it, it promotes the wrong kind of female values. I, I, well, uh, uh, I think the internet might believe that. Right, so <laughs> maybe this is a weird people. artifact of that. Like now they can't <laughs> sell Barbies, although those aren't acceptable. Right. Uh, are they worried that people are gonna? But then you know, a, a Ray, a Ray action figure is not gonna be, you mm. know, like Barbie. So no, no, I know. I uh, also like. I really worry in general about the politicization of children's toys because I mean, again, like one of the things she liked most was a massive cardboard box, and you think, <laughs> you know, it's just like 
just give your kids different stuff and then if they like something that's cool you can give them more of that i think everyone should just do that and stop worrying about this this thing but i guess you know the toys have to be available in the first place don't they so you, if you're disney you should make your make your star wars action figures yeah we're, we're boggled officially boggled by this i'm boggled time to be boggled by the games that were released this week in 2006 thanks to eurogamer and producer jimmy now Let's uh, let's just take a, a little pause here because we have a there's a conspiracy theory about this feature, which is that we think that Eurogamer's tracking may have gone a bit wrong in uh, in 2006. So we're back down to two games now. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna say I'm I'm a believer. I'm gonna say that I think the tracking is still working okay, uh, and and that this wasn't sort of some dark day of of Eurogamer's analytical failure. So in in January 2006, on the 20th of January, we have Ridge Racer 6 on the Xbox 360. Now, we just talked about arcade games. I didn't even know that there was a Ridge Racer 6. I thought there was, like, Ridge Racer and Ridge Racer DX100 or something, and then that was it. Did you ever play any Ridge Racers? No, I think there was a Ridge Racer on the PSP that was, like, Mm. a sort of mildly big deal. I think there might even have been a Ridge Racer on the Vita as well. Uh, Mm. I'm not really a racing guy unless it's F-Zero X. Uh, Mm. So no, but obviously the Xbox has a lot of racing games. Ridge Racer. Um, The Settler's Heritage of Kings. Legends. That's too many subtitles. Too many words. Definitely on the PC. Bad games companies. The Settler's was the first game I ever bought that cost £45. I told the story before. Wow. As such, I was quite disappointed by it. Was that the Settler's 1 or 2? Because uh, two was the more popular good one, as I recall. It might have been two. It might have been two. I'd know if I saw the box. But yes. Yes. Right, that's the end of that. And we move gracefully into the present day with the top 10 UK Steam games. And before that, I will clear my throat, which sounds like this. <clears throat> oh, there we dear. are. Number 10 is Rise of the Tomb Raider, uh, which is a pre order. Number 9 is Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Number 8 is Grand Theft Auto V. Number 7 is Darkest Dungeon. Congratulations to the Darkest Dungeon team on releasing their game. Fabulous indie game. Really nice team. Uh, I don't need to tell you to buy it because it's number 7 in the Steam games. But uh, well done there. XCOM 2 pre-order at number 6. Counter-Strike Go at number 5. Tom Clancy's The Division pre-order at number 4. Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. Now, I've not experienced dragon's dogma i barely know what it is in fact i think i know what it is but i don't but a lot of people say it's very good and underrated do you know what it is uh like only very vaguely i think like the kind of interesting point here is all of these games that really were traditionally massively like console stalwarts now come out a bit later on the pc and a lot of people seem to like them on the pc as well they do indeed. Uh, number two, I'm just doing a stealth Google. Is uh, is Scrap Mechanic? Um, now, given that it's a game on Steam that's catapulted itself into the top ten, and we don't know what genre it is, what genre do you think it is? Yeah, I don't actually think it's a survival game. Is it a survival game? <laughs> it's a survival game. Yes, it is a survival oh, okay. game. Okay. Uh, oh my it's goodness. It's about building vehicles, and it looks exactly the same as all of those other games, but for some reason. This one is popular. I mean, I just don't know anymore, man. Like, where do these games come from? I heard someone say the other day that that nobody under the age of 30 reads the games press anymore. And they all just watch YouTube and use social media. And that was was considered to be, like, a a sane thing to say. So is that why we don't know where these things are coming from? Are they all just coming from... Yeah, are they all just coming from YouTube and social media? Uh, Yeah, I guess so. That's uh, that's disturbing. We're out of touch. Yeah, man, of course we are. Of course we are. But luckily, people who play our games, a lot of them are over 30, so hey. Uh, number one is Homeworld Deserts of Karak, and we talked about that before, but, I mean, number one, like... It's got 90 crazy. in PC Gamer, um, okay. and it's supposed to be good, and I think Homeworld's a pretty big license, and the videos look really good as well. I guess there's uh, a lot of people uh, over 30 who are reading that review. Yeah, but, I'm probably going to buy this. Okay, uh, cool. Even though I'm kind of really out on RTSs, something about mm. this attra- is attractive to me. So I think there's something about the concept of this game uh, that works for people. I think people are ready mm. projecting here. I think people are ready for like an RTS game that harkens back to the old days. Well, Grey Goo did very well. Um, 
so oh, that's good. that would that would indicate that to be true. Uh, yes, yeah, I might also play this. I don't know about playing single player RTS again after my intense StarCraft experiences, which have now sadly lapsed into the past because I can't maintain. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll play it too. Uh, that's the end of that. Now, instead of the television and film lounge area, um, I wanted to tell you about a game. You know, remember them? Um, a, a video game. A video game. Well, oh, weird. Now, yes, d- debatably so. So, uh, at Pocket Gamer, I met the uh, the wonderful friend of the show and occasional guest presenter, Andrew John Smith. Oh dear. And he showed me this game called Tap Titans, which is a free to play game uh, on on the iPhone. And I was so amazed by just the, the where free to play games have gone. So this is a genre called a clicker, which you may not be familiar with. Okay. And a clicker is a game where you just tap the screen and you don't do anything else. Oh. So it's it's less it's less work than even like a Clash of Clans or a Farmville. Oh. So this game you have a little character and and it's viewed from behind the character. It's two D and monsters appear facing you on the screen and you tap them lots of times and they die and you get gold. And then as you level up, you can get minions who appear and they also attack the monster at the same time as you. And you can level them up and you get time limited skills and so on. But the thing that this game does, which I really like, is as you get more minions, when you leave the app, the minions, inverted commas, play the game. And then when you go back into the game, you get all the gold that they've managed to accrue in your absence. So if you want to, you can just invest all of your gold into minions, which is what I did, and then just go away and not play the game for a bit and then come back, spend all your gold leveling up get it to the point where you know you can really knock down the monsters you can also opt out of the boss fights at the end of each stage which advance you so you start fighting the boss if it's too hard you just leave and then you can farm the monsters on that level so the game is very clever because it makes you think you're exploiting it it really makes you feel like you found a cool farming technique when you've balanced out all the leveling between your minions and they're just there and the monsters are dying instantly but the thing it does is every level you go up everything kind of increases almost exponentially so it's very much harder to kill each successive boss um and it's quite a deep game there are really crazy strategies on reddit for like when you should level up which thing someone's made a tool which is called yatta i can't remember what that stands for where if you get your seed from the game you can put it in there uh, and it will tell you the current state of everything and exactly what you should do next to have the most perfectly optimized leveling up of your minions um, and as a casual game, for me, it's really, really stupid, but it's so stupid that it works. I actually really enjoy playing it. I'm still playing it now. Um, I can't justify that because there's sort of virtually no gameplay, but it's just very addictive. Um, is, it, yeah. is it too late to do something else with my life? Like, <laughs> this is just really the most bizarre thing. I, 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 I can't cope with it. It's um, an amazing game. I think you should play it. It's really, it, the stupidity of it is so intense that it, it changes your life it looks you it. extremely nice mm. uh I, I the graphics are nice and um but i'm glad that it has some strategy <laughs> uh i'm just kind of bemused by like this feels a bit like mmo combat in some ways where it started yeah. off from like the seed of something which made a bit of sense yes. and then just kind of grew in like the most weird mutated manner into something that was just so complex and bizarre yes that it's like barely barely understandable so that's why that's yes nice. I, I find it so fascinating um the monetization it's not like a particularly high grossing game and that makes a lot of sense to me because i can't currently imagine why anyone would pay money for any of the stuff that you can buy so you you can buy like your skills recharging faster you can buy like a very quick you know series of attacks that will kill lots of enemies lots of bosses i think you can buy minions and stuff but but like to me the whole fun of the game seems to be about how you you get this feeling like you're you're exploiting it with some weird set of strategies that you've devised yourself even though of course you haven't so i don't really understand how that works one thing that does work is you get a fairy that appears and she flies around with a chest and if you tap on her um sometimes you can watch an incentivized video advert and the video (laughs) adverts are just for games that are a bit like that game and they're all really weird and they look stupid so i don't mind watching sorry there's a fairy you tap on her and you watch an advert that's yes the whole thing you know what i'm really hoping that everything is like this Mm. until we release the game after the game we're doing now (laughs) which i hope will just show everyone that well now we've now we've got something different well yes but this is this is i think this is like i've read quite a few reviews of it and people say that this is like the end point of this genre they've actually found (laughs) this 
this nadir or, or apex <laughs> of this uh, of this particular type of design. So very fascinating, but I, I don't think I'm going to be playing it for that much longer. Uh, but it was interesting to actually get into one of these games, to get really into it and also not want to spend money very strongly. Like, uh, when I was sort of test playing Clash of Clans, I did feel like I might want to spend some money, but with this, I haven't, so maybe they haven't got that bit right. But yes, Tap Titans, a fascinating game. Good, I will probably try and give it a go. <laughs> You'll hate it with the Good. very core like of your the being. feeling of hating things. Right, now we move on to your listener questions, and we have regular listener Ian Hardingham. And uh, he asked us to discuss a tweet from Troy Goodfellow, which says, My favourite thing about Fallout 4 last year may be that it was announced and had basically no preview campaign and came out five months later. So what did you want to say about this? I was kind of intrigued because, you know, generally Bethesda, with their RPGs, have had a pretty massive, long marketing thing. Mm. Like, I remember Oblivion and Skyrim. You know, I, I generally think that they do marketing pretty well. And I, I think he's right in general that Fallout 4 didn't have a huge amount of marketing until, you know, the couple of weeks beforehand when they kind of blitzed it. And I was kind of interested in what you thought about that. I mean, I feel like he's kind of referring to previews more than he is to marketing. Because I certainly saw a lot of marketing in advance of it. Maybe you're right and it's a shorter time scale. Yeah, I think Fallout 4 was announced... I, I don't know if it was announced five months before it came out, but it had, like, a, a teaser thing, mm. and then nothing for quite a long time, and then, yeah. like, a round of previews, and then not a huge amount until it kind of ramped up in the month beforehand, which yeah. fe- feels a, a bit different for me. And, I mean, of course, you know, the best thing for a game is if it's marketed at you constantly for seven years. Like, I understand that that's the best thing. Um, but it is kind of nice when you have a game that's a bit exciting to you that kind of comes out a bit earlier than you're expecting. Mm, they d- definitely did feel like it wasn't the longest wait ever until it came out. And that might be an interesting play to do with a very big franchise where... Because Fallout 4 is, as most people have said, it's basically a kind of slightly popularist iteration on Fallout 3. So it's it's about sort of taking a formula that, that worked commercially, even though there's some significant gameplay differences... And then just sort of pushing that in a bit more of a, of a commercial direction. So maybe it's better for that to have more of a sudden impact, perhaps. That might be a good play for that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it was exceptionally successful, I think, yeah. Fallout 4. And I, and I think really... I don't know about you saying it's like a an evolution of Fallout 3 in a certain way. I, I suppose that's right. Um but yeah, well, I guess we'll see what, what we do next. It's still like years until the next Elder Scrolls is due, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, which no, is sad be... because I want to play an Elder Scrolls that's not set in an icy wasteland. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is interesting though. I mean, you said before on, on this show, or you, you sort of wanted to see if there was any doubt that the Star Wars marketing campaign <laughs> was sort of over the top. Um, and I very firmly said no. But... I still wonder if there's anything there, like, in terms of, for different types of thing, is the length of the campaign more important than other factors? Because it could well be. I mean, people know it's so hard to study this stuff. People don't well, know. Well, new friend of the podcast, Tim, hmm. who I had a drink with yesterday, he said something that I found really interesting. He said he thought that Star Wars The Force Awakens might be the most hyped thing that we ever have again. Right. Um, and usually saying that kind of thing is wrong because all records are broken like tomorrow. Mm. Um, but I was kind of interested by by the by the concept. I think like if there was ever going to be anything you could ever say that about, it would be this film. Yeah. Um, because it's a it's an existing IP that has. Ha- I mean, you know, I don't. We have to explain why. But it is mm. kind of an interesting thing to examine because you know it's it's the company with. I, I think it's probably fair to say that Disney has the most marketing muscle. Yeah, in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in it's in it's this IP that is, it, it just can be attractive to almost any segment, hmm. um, and and we were talking a lot about how things are generally becoming uh, less pop- popularist. Like the the a failing TV network TV show from thirty years ago had ratings that eclipsed an incredibly successful show now. Yeah. Um, so there is an extent to which nichification 
is going to make it harder. But of course, you're still going to have these massive things like the Avengers and stuff. But I thought mm-hmm. it was interesting that I could, I just, I couldn't actually just completely discard that out of hand. No, I think it's a good candidate for most hyped and also future most hyped um, because you're right. Like, w- what is bigger in a movie context than than Star Wars? I mean. Pfft. It's not comparable, but I'm sure we'll see the same thing for the Blade Runner thing, you know. But, but yeah, what what are, what are these massive franchises that people love so much that haven't haven't been rebooted yet in some form, or or, or you know, a do a second wave reboot? I don't think there are. So yeah, most and, and those like, IPs that are big enough for that are usually yearly now, which actually just right. kind of limits to, them to having less time to be hyped for any specific one than Star Wars had. Yeah. All right. Um, so we move on to a question from uh, to Shrike. Now I have to leave you guys now. Okay. Are you going to be able to handle the rest of the show on your own? I can certainly handle the rest of the show on my own. It'll be delightful. But well, yes. it was nice talking to you. It was, it was lovely. Goodbye, and uh, I'll see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Right, so as Ian leaves, uh, I'm going to solo do a few of your questions that you've been sending in. Um, so Tishrike, uh asked about this idea of open world games and uh, whether or not they can be too big. Um, using a quote from uh, a Doc Rant's video where he says, how can the player focus on what's important if the game itself refuses to do so? So this was taking an X, uh, XCKD or XKCD or whatever, I don't read it, um, comic where uh, Randall Munro had made this big sort of fake open world environment that where you fly out of the comic on a hoverboard and you can go around and discover stuff. And this guy was basically saying that that really puts a hard limit on how interesting the content can be. Um, he said that he wants the refined short form content that Randall Monroe is known for, not the sort of vague emptiness. And yeah, this is something Ian and I have talked about quite a lot, um, is about the level of detail that you put into a world uh, versus the size of that world. And I really think that we're starting to see games really challenge the ideas of what scope is good, what scope is fun, and what scope is interesting. And I really think that now the time will come for sort of smaller open worlds that do have a lot more detail in them again. I think people really, really want that. I was looking on RPS uh, recently about this game Consortium, which is based on a spaceship and based around interacting with a kind of small group of characters and seeing the impact of your actions. Uh, And I think through various factors, this idea of particularly connecting with characters is going to be something that's much better facilitated by a smaller open world structure. Um, again, we've had lots of conversation about this on the show before, but open world is something where structural innovation is the thing that, that absolutely needs to happen. Um, Total Biscuits video of the Ma- Ma- Mad Max game where he kind of goes through and describes all the, the points on the map where you can do things are sort of feeling a bit empty and um, just feeling like dots on a map. I think the dots on a map idea is uh, is something that will change because it's very much of this time it's very much of the grand theft auto era so these bigger scope games i think will learn how to do content better i think everyone's looking at no man's sky to see if that's going to be something genuinely interesting in that regard Um, and also we'll see smaller scope games so i feel like this is a good um discussion to kind of have as an ongoing issue in games no one game is going to solve it There's going to be a lot of push and pull around the place. So thanks for that interesting question. Right, um, we have a question now from Nina White, and she asks, do you have any interesting classic ghost stories? If so, any particular favourites or memorable ones? And or what is the best allegedly true ghost story you heard, read? Do you have any of your own? So ghost stories. um, Now, I've never been that big into ghost stories and horror fiction, certainly. I suppose I've got a bit more into horror movies, uh, recently for some reason um just because i find the sort of weird constraints of that form quite interesting but i but i have a few things for this so i think the best ghost story was it, it was more of a sort of ghost rumor that that happened when uh, when i was young where i lived there was a train station that was disused and it was a really big building it had two floors and um it was abandoned and and all sort of boarded up on the site and if you looked in through one window 
you could see this weird looking painting on the wall of this dude uh, kind of right behind all of this rubbish that had been accumulated in there. And of course, all the local kids said um, that, that that painting was evil and it was possessed. And if you looked at it, certain things would happen. And I used to go past this building quite a lot. And just those rumors about it really made me scared to look in there in case there was anything. Now, I realize this story seems like it's building up to some kind of amazing ghost punk punchline or conclusion, but it's not. Uh, it was just the atmosphere around that thing that, that was created. And I found that sort of more more compelling than any any real ghost stories um so i kind of like things like that rumored things there's a really good thread i can't believe i'm using these words together there's a no sleep thread on reddit which is normally dreadful but there's one about you, you should look this up it's about a guy um who is or is is playing the character of um a ranger in uh, in a forest and he said that when he started work there were um he would come across a staircase just a, an abandoned staircase in the woods and he would ask um a colleague you know what's up with these staircases and the colleague would get very defensive and say don't talk about that don't go near them just just leave them alone like we don't it's not in our remit to deal with that and he would see these staircases appearing or disappearing and then he he has various accounts of kind of horrific things happening around the places where these things are but it's never explained what they are or how they work or how they relate to things i really really love how this is written whether it's true or not i mean it's quite it's quite difficult to say which is good um but it's the idea where you don't have to explain everything you don't have to have the whole sort of arcane system behind something um have been watching a lot of x files recently and, and one of the flaws that writers had on that series is that they would often try and wrap things up to the extent that at least, you know, Mulder's version of it would be correct. Uh, and sort of as the viewer, that was the most plausible thing to believe. And I think later on, they kind of got a bit more sophisticated with that. But I really love ambiguity around why something is there, particularly something common that you, you know, you might come across one of these staircases. I know if I see that in, in a wood, I, I'll genuinely be a, feel afraid just, just momentarily because of reading all this stuff. Um, so I like things like that. So my, my taste in ghost stories and, and, and sort of mystical stories are very specific. Anyway, I hope that was interesting. Steve Eardley asks, um, can you think of any instance where a hacking mini game is actually a good idea or are they universally terrible? Um, hacking mini games have been a staple uh, for such a long time. I mean, uh, pfft, the pipe mania thing in Bioshock, I suppose, was OK. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm such an anti mini game person. I'm just the wrong person to ask. Uh, we need a, a pro mini game person on the show to argue the case for them. But but I really don't think they they are. It always seems to have that problem for me of taking you out of the mood of the game you're currently in. If I'm playing a big open world game, I don't want to be playing, you know, a sliding block puzzle or pipe mania at that moment in time. It's also so very much artificial, it doesn't really feel like I'm doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And that's a very important factor for me in games is suspension of disbelief and just the, the feeling that I'm really the character. Uh, and mini games really, really take that away for me. So no, I don't think there there are any good ones. I think the university terrible. Uh, final question now from Cheshire. And he says, how often do you get tired of listening to your own music when you compose it? Now, I'm pretty unusual in that I really like listening to my own music, both when I compose it and afterwards. Um, I find that I generally am making music that I want to listen to. So when I get something sounding good, I actually really enjoy listening to it back a lot. Also, I think when you get more experienced, certainly as a, as a producer and as an engineer, you're able to listen to music with different hats on very readily. So if I'm listening through for mix issues, it's completely different to when I'm listening through for musical composition issues or when I'm listening through casually. I can switch into one of those modes quite easily um, and listen to a piece of music in a, in a different way. That's not a sort of amazing superpower. It's just a natural part of anyone who does anything creative can do that. You can try and put yourself in the naive mode of a, of a first time listener and go, what am I going to find cool about this? What are the exciting new sounds? What are the weird, surprising transitions and so on? You, you, you have to be able to do that in order to make anything. So um, I would say that I don't I don't get tired. Some tracks 
are worse than others. Some things you think are terrible, and again, this is a very common creative thing. By the end, you think that the track is bad and you just don't separate that from the fact that you've listened to it a lot. So one of the things I've learned to do is if I hit that point to really sort of interrogate in an analytical way if it's bad. So if I've repeated myself a lot, if I've done you know, bad, a bad breakdown that doesn't have good production in it, or if I've used a boring sound or something, I can, I'll go through and look for things that are actually bad. And if there is something that is actually bad, I'll just fix that. And if there isn't, I'll just go, okay, and I'll finish the track off, um, normally polish it up, and, and then sort of get it into a finished format. Because if there's one thing that I've learned about music production, it's that you don't know what people are going to like. Uh, you might have a general idea, a stylistic idea, but in terms of individual tracks, it's so difficult to predict what's going to be an inverted commas hit or not. Um, so yeah, a, uh, a somewhat long-winded and rambling music rant to and on there. <laughs> and on? End on even. I make more verbal mistakes when Ian's not here. He's kind of a psychological corrective for me in many ways but it's been great to uh, have you with us on the podcast thank you very much for listening and both of us will be back next week goodbye that's it children time for bed don't forget to pay us a visit at www.visitingthevillage.com